Hey everybody, welcome to this week in pre-IPO stocks podcast. With me, I got Nick Fusco, CEO of 8View, a pre-IPO secondary market pricing company, and Evan Cohen, co-founder and chief operating officer of withvincent.com, a media company focused on alternative investments. Okay, fellas, open AI, 150 billion. Huh? All right, so um, here it is. Like, do you come into a company that has a $150 billion nod, right? SpaceX is at 210. Like, you know, it's venture capital investing. One could argue maybe companies at this size with this revenue, maybe that's not really venture. But, you know, if you come in and it's, you want two, three, four X, I mean, this, this company gets to be, it's going to be a big company, right? So like, here's the question. Does OpenAI have potential to be like a trillion dollar business, like in the, up in the echelons of the Apples and the Microsofts and, and everything else, right? Like, like, Evan, what do you think? Because could this company be kind of a 10x from here? Does it still have that potential, open AI? Um, well, you know where I stand on my stance of open AI in general. I, mean, I think it's a very impressive technology. I'm always, you know, very sure how the business model operates. I will say I did play around with their latest model last week. Before the news of the new funding round was sort of like rumored pop, pop out, and I was incredibly impressed. I'm like, this is a really okay. big step function in the model and the ability for it to process. I was really impressed. So I was like, wait a second, maybe this is actually something much bigger than even I prospected. And then look, there are trillion dollar technology companies already in the in the world. So can this be one yeah. of them? You know, anything can happen. I certainly feel like it's not off the table. Um, I do feel like the Apple partnership, now that they're rolling out the new iOS and the new iPhones with Apple Intelligence, that's going to be a great big thing for them. I do believe the new model is really impressive and that could be a big step function for them. So look, I think there's an opportunity there for a 5Xer, 6Xer. I think closer, five, I'd be much more confident if you told me it was a $500, million, $500 billion valuation than a uh, one, tr one trillion. But a trillion, it, yeah. It's a lot, but you know, so it's not happen, a no. especially with inflation. Inflation, for sure. Got Why it. Not? <laughs> I like that. Inflation. Zinger at the end. So Nick, what do you think, man? Trillion dollars? Is that is there a probability? Or are you more like Evan? Kind of 500 billion feels better. No, I, I, I think it's fair. I like the end on the inflation aspect. I'm not going to go down, down the inflation uh, route, but I, but I will say, I mean, I mean, a lot of these plays are somewhat deflationary, I believe, actually. But, but also, they will get to that one trillion point. And, you know, as, as long as they come out as the the winning horse here, um, along with the, the other the other LLM plays, but also right. I think what's going to happen is because of the the interplay between Microsoft, Apple, and everybody else, um, they're just going to be that far ahead as well. You know, so by the time OpenAI does arrive to that one trillion, if it's Anthropic or OpenAI or whomever it might be, you're going to have a lot of the other leaders maintain. Their, their healthy distance. So there will be a delta. Maybe that delta percentage-wise is going to shrink. But, yeah. but I think the bigger players are, are maintaining the advantage, but also getting their nice hooks in, you know? And, right. And that's a big part of this funding round too. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the one thing that I didn't mention at the open here was they, they first, they kind of announced their revenue numbers and split between direct-to-consumer and uh, business to business, right? So the information had this. So it was a billion dollars of ARR for B two B, right? Uh, versus three point four million. This is as of March, right? So it was about twenty nine percent of their revenue was B two B, and the rest was kind of direct to consumer. So that to me, I feel like that. I feel like B two B is going to be eighty percent of their revenue, right? You know, like that, maybe more, right down the road. And we've already all talked about it, how we just think that cycle, that's just starting to happen, right? Where businesses are starting to implement and it, AI it, yeah. in kind of a proper way. Yeah, and I think you nailed it. And we were harping on that a week or two ago, right? Like the B2B is the, the main number that I want to watch. But maybe they're doing something really, really clever here, uh, a little bit different than maybe what Apple did when we were all kids, pushing Macs into the classroom and things like that. But you get the B2C user base, get them really, really comfortable with it. And eventually, we want to bring that into the business. Guess what? What are you most comfortable with? Oh, it's yeah. this technology. And then it becomes the B2B. And then we know that we can really crank up uh, the uh, the price on the B2B side because of the inelasticity, right? So, right. so yeah, I, but Evan, I think that's, who cares if it's 29 today? It will go yeah. more towards that 80 down the road. Got, great. So Evan, so Evan, these guys, are like, if you think about 
like these guys are masters of the universe type people, right? So like Sam Altman's, you know, like a, a kingmaker in uh, Silicon Valley. And then he's got unlimited capital. I mean, the people that are investing in this thing have unlimited amounts of money, right? So who knows what other businesses they could get into, you know what I mean? Or even really what's coming down the pipe for AI. I mean, God only knows, right? What this stuff could look like. I mean, would you go back to like, 2004 or five and say Google would be a cloud business, have a huge cloud business. I wouldn't have said that. <laughs> I mean, cloud didn't even really exist. You know what I'm saying? So like, like, what do you think? Are there, is that potential too? that maybe open AI starts to move out into other kind of business areas, maybe associated with AI or downstream upstream from AI? I think that needs to happen. I mean, you, you look at all of the multi, multi-trillion dollar technology companies, they all have multiple business lines that are humming. And actually what you really see is all of them have one or two business lines, which have an insane margin where you're like, wait a second, mm-hmm. this like, like Google with search or Amazon with AWS, where there's this one business that's just a cash juggernaut, makes a ton of Fair. money, highly profitable, and they can use those profits to invest in the other bets of the business, which allow that valuation to compound and grow. Now, OpenAI right. doesn't have that cash juggernaut in the same way yeah. that like a Google and Amazon does, but it could, especially when you look at like the unlock of Apple and Apple intelligence. And I can imagine there's some sort of revenue share where they unlock a premium feature because Apple's really looking to harness their services business. So you imagine right. like a, an, a Siri plus or a premium tier here where OpenAI is getting a cut of that revenue and you're talking, you know, billions of users on, around the world with iPhones or whatever. It, it, it's a huge unlock. It's not there today. Yep. A question I have for you, actually, since you asked the question about whether they'll reach a trillion dollar valuation, what yeah. revenue number do you think they need to hit to have that valuation? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, like, look, I would say 50 billion feels right. I mean, that's 20, 20 times. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, like, I, I think if you have a 20, look, it, the timing matters too, right? So if they, if they go from 5 billion, you know, where I think they're going to be at the end of this year to a 50 billion in like, you know, let's say seven years time, that's a lot of revenue in a short period, I think in a relatively short period of time that warrants like a 20 times revenue multiple. You know, if we're looking like 15 years from now and they're at a 20, you know, they're at a, you know, they're at 50 billion. I don't know. Maybe like that's maybe not so, not as interesting, still attractive, but not as interesting. So I think the accelerate, the the quick, how quick they get there. I do think 20 is the right number, right? But I do think how quick they get there to the 50 will, it it will, they'll need to get there relatively quickly to well, maintain just, and, and kind of that 20x well to yeah. use a comparison with the like the traditional trillion dollar technology companies they trade at like between 20 and 30 earnings earnings not revenue earnings. right so i feel right. like at 50 billion revenue for open ai what is the earnings what's the, the margin on that where they're yeah, really but, getting to the valuation uh, of trillion yeah yeah evan if, you, if you're doing that though how long did it take microsoft to get a whole lot longer than it could take open ai you know, so that's where the growth comp- that's component the speed, comes man. in with, with Aaron's number, right? So you got to do it fast. Like, look, I, I will offer this too. I do think that there's a place where if OpenAI can convince, you know, C-suites that they can eliminate people and replace them with AI, right? That they can charge a lot more money than what they're charging today. The va- because that's immense value. So there could be an argument for like increasing the price of what of their solutions to you know because if you're paying a person a hundred thousand dollars a year plus benefits and everything else you're in you're into them for like 115 120 then you can come in and replace them with an ai for twenty five thousand a year i mean you're probably doing that right that's a good that's a good investment so i mean if you can if you like clarn is talking about taking down more than 50 percent of their staff 60 percent of their staff right so like if someone came to you as a ceo with that trade-off say like look how much is your staffing cost what's this all right reduce that number by 60 percent and i'll take half You're like yeah yeah and if that becomes your core, good to me let's do it your core you know I mean? your core business i mean that that really compounds elsewhere too because then you don't need as many people for hr you're not getting as many uh HR style violations either, yeah. you know, then you, your finance team might not need to be quite as large either because it's more simplified and, and then it just goes and goes to all those, 
Yeah. <laughs> like, gonna stuff say. like that. I mean, I mean, like, but you're not wrong, Nick. I mean, this is, this is the, I mean, maybe this sounds a little silly and I'm probably oversimplifying it, but I do think that these are some of the decision points that companies, C-suites will be having, right? Is, is, is that, and then it, all of a sudden when everyone realizes how valuable these things are, it could get really interesting. But like you say, Evan, there's these open source models too. So that's going to, I think, ultimately impact, you know, uh, pricing pressure on, uh, on what people can really charge for this stuff. So it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, Nick, let me ask you this, since it sounds like you're sort of bullish on the trillion dollar opportunity. If open AI is worth a trillion dollars, how much is NVIDIA worth? And I'll give you the numbers <laughs> today. NVIDIA is worth 2.8 trillion today and open AI is looking to what raise it at 150 billion. So if you're talking, a let's say a five X or let's, let's say let's call open AI two, it's a five X jump on open AI. Where's NVIDIA? I'm making them do the I, math. I Let's actually say. think you're going to have, what, let's say that it goes from five to four to three. I don't, I don't have huge ups, like I don't see a massive upside in the long term for NVIDIA, to be fair, because I think they're really uh -huh. taking advantage of uh, the shortage of, of chips and, and what everybody demands immediately. And I also think the efficiency of the models will probably get better over time and we'll be smarter about using them. So, so yeah, I would say that goes, from, if it's at a five, then a, a five, a four, a three. Let's say I'd say I had a, the next uh, five years and then the next five years after that, something along those lines. I mean, that's still I, I had a, brilliant, right? For yeah. NVIDIA, it's still <laughs> it like a brilliant like case, but, it, but it's just not going to be as big of a difference. I, I had a advisor client of mine send me uh, a video of Grok's CEO yeah. giving a, doing an interview. Grok's a chip company, right? They're focused on inference. So they kind of compete with NVIDIA. And he had some really interesting things talking about capacity. You know, so effectively, NVIDIA is like at capacity on how much chips they can make. And they've already sold those out into the marketplace, right? Um, so like the amount of compute, the total amount of compute globally, globally is like set. So, I mean, that's where Evan, like, I think I wouldn't be surprised if OpenAI starts making their own chips, they, uh, right? I mean, Meta is, right? But Meta yeah. is, Google is, yeah. right? That all, that all weighs on the valuation of OpenAI. Because those are all, that's all CapEx. That's all expenditure. Well, unless they, all, are, unless. It hurts, the, it hurts the, mer the margin, which makes the business. No, but, if it, lost, but, but if we're flooding the market with every, more and more folks that are making chips, more and more are tied at the hip with open AI, they get their allocations. I mean, we probably all saw the, the Larry Ellison speech that was like yeah, I flooding saw Twitter. He was just like, <laughs> we, we, uh, we went out to lunch. And, and we were like, take my money, just take it. And then. I guess he and Elon got their allocation, but it's still like, you know, if supply equals demand, if there's way more supply and we're not uh, hell bent on it being an NVIDIA chip and it could be Zuckerberg's chip or whomever else's, I mean, right. that that is to the benefit of open AI, Anthropic, et cetera, right? So, well, they'll be selling it. I guess that's what I'm saying. Evan. Like, if they have this and they kind of crack the code on, um, compute and developing chips like the, these guys at grok have something special i mean they, they basically like have re-engineered how to make chips specifically for inference right that's like running ai models and they're using like older technology it's like really interesting and smart so they're kind of sidestepping nvidia and the supply chain and, and, a, and a lot of different there's a lot of innovation in what they're doing so you know open ai starts to hit this wall on compute and they're like all right we got to figure this out and they all of a sudden innovate and find some new solution. And then that unlocks capacity to compute and they're able to sell that to third parties too. That's like kind of a hyperscaler type situation, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like it, it, I think it's interesting to think, think about what new businesses would, are going to come out of this place. It's not going to just be what we see today at OpenAI, right? They're going to have other kind of businesses that will evolve and they'll move into just like I think all these big tech companies have. Yeah, I guess I just find it very interesting that on in one business in one or one segment, there's the AI language, large language model businesses where you're perfectly comfortable saying OpenAI is going to five x, six x, seven x, whatever, get to a trillion dollar valuation, knowing that there's incredibly comparable competitors in the market in a, probably a business that's probably going to 
crunch on margin. And then in another yeah. business where we're sitting here where there's like chips and uh, silicone and where we have a clear market leader in NVIDIA, which has like the IP and has been around for a long time. And you're, you're like, oh, well, their valuation can't grow as quickly because there's all these competitors like Rock there and come and get lunch or take market share. And I guess it's sure. like, I find it very, I, I feel, I find those two ideas. I mean, you can have two ideas in your head, of course, but I find it like somewhat contract, like contradicting. Cause you're like, well, on one hand, there's a world where there, there's clear, clear market, like these guys are just going to eat everyone else's lunch on this one where someone's already eaten lunch. Like that's oh, it's never going to happen. Well, what <laughs> if, gonna drop wouldn't you, it. wouldn't you compare it to, I mean, pop, uh, pop NVIDIA into somewhat closer to a commodity because you know, you have other chip manufacturers with them directly in their sites and then maybe put open ai much more aligned to the search business of google yahoo has the same thing bing or whomever you know pick it pick your ask well, teams, i think you know like open eye is closer to anthropic and the llm business where there's okay, but yeah, open source models like llama but, yeah, but yahoo <laughs> and google i mean they searched that the results are pretty similar but then once google took that step and got further and further ahead that, that's a fair point. That's the, the tough part that, that everybody else is going to have to crack. And to Aaron's point about how easily OpenAI has been able to raise the valuation and raise capital, uh, probably also get a revolving line of credit here. Watch, who, who's the CEO of Anthropic? Is he or she going to be able to do that? I don't know their name right now. <laughs> All right. You know, I think that's a key differentiator. Their, their ability to to tap that infinite supply of money in this space, that's going to really be an outsized difference for them. Well, this, this is why I love investing because this type of, this is what makes a market, right? Totally. Like yeah. People have different opinions on this stuff. And, this is what, you know, and uh, yeah, man, it's like, this is, this is what it's all about, right? So oh, hence the question on if they can get to a trillion or not. Hey, hey, listen, it's no I was like done. I'm like, I played with one, uh, whatever, oh, whatever, oh, one, their new model last week. And then this week, and I saw it drop this morning. And I was like, hey, Microsoft app portfolio. Like, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm just getting the indirect exposure. What they own a ton of open AI. It just, you know, it's yeah, sort of, it's true. Just betting on the stream without having to find the private deal. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Okay. Let's hit on United Airlines did a deal with Starlink. Okay. So here's my question for you guys. Does and so, so Starlink for those that don't know uh, is SpaceX's satellite internet solution, right? So you can pop up a little Starlink dish, which is not relatively expensive in my opinion, and you get like perfect five G internet. It's like incredible, right? It's like magic. So they're putting these on planes now. Uh, Hawaiian Airlines has done it. Qatar Airlines has done it, and now United Airlines is is going to do it, right? So here's my question for you guys: Does the type or the quality of the internet on Wi-Fi on an airline actually determine whether you fly on that airline or not. I'm not flying right? United. Nick, what do you think? United. Like, what's it? I'm not flying it? United because it's United. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I would say that this. Why is that though? Hold on. Why is that? I just flew United like two weeks ago. Like, why? Why? What's wrong with United? Why don't you like the United? No, I've just been delayed on it and just haven't. Had okay. It. It's it's no service. It's like no frills. I mean, there's not a whole lot to it. Service. Yeah. So what, you were you Delta guy? No. Like well, a guy. It's a, it's well now I've had top. now I've had some pretty bad experiences on pretty much every hairline. Uh, yeah. So right. the next long haul is Virgin, uh, Virgin Atlantic. Ooh. I do still like them. They're fine in my book. But like, okay. Like yeah, I've been not uh, not really anything but souring on American different airlines. Delta. What America. about Evan? What do you think? You did you pick an airline based on stuff like Wi-Fi quality or anything like that? How do you pick um, it? So I haven't done it to date because I haven't found that any of the Wi-Fi solutions are really that reliable. So, but I, if you had, for me, the decision of where to fly or what airline to fly primarily is like which airport because we live in New York. Right. It's like, do I want to deal with that in JFK or am I flying during rush yeah. hour? Do I want to get to Newark or can I fly to LaGuardia? Newark, yikes. It all depends yeah, on like, Yeah. Like, I mean, that, that ultimately the airport determines the airlines in New York City because if you're flying on one versus the other, like they kind of have their allegiances. But if you told me that one airline had far superior Wi-Fi and I was flying right. on a business trip and I knew I needed to get work done, it would certainly yes. be a determining factor for me. To date, I haven't really found any of like I basically at this point when I fly, like I don't expect to do any real work on an airplane because like 
the Wi-Fi is so hit or miss. Like maybe get a right. crush a couple emails, but like I'm never really banking on it. But if you told me one did, like it was like really stellar and you were going to get 100 megabits consistently with no lag and you could take whatever video calls. Okay, how about this? To, done. Like, I, okay, I that so that was where that's kind of where I was thinking about it, right? Like, you know, usually you get on the stuff and they're like no video calls, no phone calls on the plane. Right. Because I think because the Wi-Fi is so bad on planes that if you did that, everybody else would get like super slow. Me? And then if enough people did, you it enough, would be done. Like you see that people get dragged off the United Airlines flights just because it's United. But imagine you're chit chatting <laughs> and then the person next to you is chirping and then the person that's uh, one seat across. Nah, man, they're getting pissed too. off. Right. You pop in, you pop in the noise canceling earbuds, our, bud, and nah, you're done. No, no. You're good so, to go. So our, our guests missed the opportunity to, to observe the cold open today, but we were talking about uh, the fisticuffs <laughs> going down at Balthazar. But um, that's not, that's not going to fly. No pun intended. No way. No, the, well, like you want to, you want to stream Netflix. Fine. D- but download it before you get on the plane. You know, who cares? So for, you know, I, yeah, this, look, I, I would, this opens up. I think this opens up a whole, you know, so, you know, on the Excella, they do like the quiet car, right? Yeah. So you want to be in the quiet part of the plane. You go sit and no, in these rows or whatever. Right. It doesn't really like work. The, the, you know, plane, I would um, say that doesn't work on an airplane, but I will say that you can call into a call, like a, like a conference call or something like that and listen and listen like that you cannot do today because the Wi-Fi is not good enough or strong enough. And for me, right. a lot of my meetings and calls are sort of like check-ins or hearing like just broader, like, you know, whatever conferences or, you know, that sort of thing. And that I would appreciate. I listen, I got to tell you guys, I think if they let people talk on the, on the phone, right? Like take phone calls. I think people would take united they would like pay more or they would change their schedule around because they could like to your point of it they could actually no work you know what i mean i mean they like, did they could work like they were at the desk for what it's worth they did use to have phones on airplanes yeah and they would charge you 20 bucks a minute you know like some oh, of the yeah gosh, i remember, I remember those yeah, yeah. with the credit you pop them out and then you do yeah. the credit card i remember that but, i remember but, that but from a cultural perspective, I think I align with Nick where there's no quiet car co- like functionality on an airplane unless they oh create that with like a real wall. I don't want to be on a – dude, I don't want to be in a subway car or anywhere where someone's taking – like I don't want to hear anyone else's calls. Like I got – even my noise canceling oh, headphones. Come on. Hold I'm on, you like, guys. I'm calling you out. I'm calling you guys out. People – all this whole like open like floor plan, desk thing. Everyone's been working at home too long. I remember being on like the floor at Morgan Stanley. Like people yeah. yelling at each other and it's Aaron, like, have, it's like half mayhem. The, in half there. the people on the plane just suck down four melatonin trying to fall asleep and you're yapping on your phone. I got yeah, – I, here, we'll go back to the violence. I got headbutt on the New York subway because I had my BlackBerry out one day too close to somebody else and didn't realize the guy just smashed around like no nobody wants this in the air you nobody, need nobody, right, nobody right, wants okay. it also so, like no, you didn't pay eight hundred dollars to get on yeah i agree so that could backfire that could backfire then so then if you did like a wi-fi starlink wi-fi on the united flight and you're like hey you can take phone calls and like some people are like i'm not flying united because i don't want to be in there with all these people on the phone totally. right that's me right yeah but, yeah interesting I'll take but Let's let's bundle this back into our last conversation though. You got great Wi-Fi. You can run AI models. You can be like, okay, like using ChatGPT or like that again. Productivity. Like you're talking about. I mean, I use these things all the time. So and you cannot. They do not work really well on Wi-Fi. I've already tried like many times. So like just another reason. Like having good Wi-Fi is a very consistently good, reliable Wi-Fi where you can do things like you are at home. Sans video right. calls and phone calls, still a big differentiator yeah. for me on a business flight, not on a personal flight. I don't care at all. Fair, fair point. Fair point. Well, fair point. I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if it would, like, I'm more of a price guy because I'm a total value freak, right? So I'm more of a price guy and the time, like what time the flight leaves versus what kind of perks they'd have. I mean, I don't get me wrong, I get super salty if they have the direct TV option on the flight which is like the worst you know what i mean um but anyway the yeah it'll be interesting to see how this plays out i have to imagine this is like a pretty nice revenue deal for starlink right you know what i mean so they didn't disclose the terms of the deal but i would hope they offer it for free i think free i think they Wi-Fi are no a, it's free it's they free are for offering free. it for free yeah so god they damn right heaven that's what i'm saying like it's like if they do i'm i don't know I, there's a lot you could do with this now. 
Okay. There's a lot you could do with this now, now that you got this and it's like in your living room, but you're on the plane. You know what I mean? So it'd be interesting to see what, how they, what kind of solutions they, they give, but yeah, they say it's going to be free. They're trying to get more business yeah. travelers. So. SpaceX, $1 trillion business. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> don't get me started on that yeah, one. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I, I love I think that that's, company. That's the race. Who's going to arrive there first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that, yeah. This is also a branding exercise. You know, that's for sure. Every time you're up there, you're 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 exposing your your brand to someone new that's not familiar with Starlink or doesn't realize. Oh, I'm over the over the ocean or over over where. That's a good point. And I that's very I smart. I didn't thought about that. Internet. So yeah, that's very smart. And that's a Aaron, good point. you sent around that Delta uses uh, via stat, or via sat. Right. They're down twenty three percent in the last year. Yeah. And then you said American Airlines is on IntelliSat, and that's private. So yeah. I don't know where that is, but um, yeah. But I'm not long they, either of those yeah. companies. Uh, I mean, Elon could come and just eat their lunch, right? For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I don't, I, my, I'm not, I don't know a lot about satellite internet, but my understanding is those two are stationary satellites. So they're not global. It's just like us only, you, you know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, Starlink's global, right? So like, you know, it's one thing, I mean, I, obviously we're all us guys, right? So we're thinking about what it's like in the United States, but Delta flies globally, United airlines flies globally or, uh, you know, American flies globally. And then there's of course, international carriers as well. So any of those guys want a solution, that might be the only game in town is to use Starlink, right? So it'd be, it'd be kind of key, key, cool to see how this all plays out. I mean, but, United uh, Airlines is only worth $16 billion. They may as well just buy the whole airline. <laughs> just, just buy that whole thing, man. Who wants to I mean, own an airline though? Yeah, hard no. So the, uh, the okay, last topic, eToro. We haven't talked about crypto in a long time. Like a long time, fellas. So eToro got slapped around by the SEC this past week. They got fined uh, not much money, $1.5 million. It's like a drop in the bucket. But I think it's more brand branding than anything. But the, they basically said they can only trade Bitcoin and Ethereum, Bitcoin right? Cash. And all the other coins have to stop, and Bitcoin Cash, and all the other coins have to go away. So, I mean, eToro was like a big crypto player. Right. At least that's how they were positioning themselves is to be big in, in crypto. But like, here's the question. Here's the question. Since we haven't talked about crypto in a while. So you got Coinbase out there. Right. But now you have these ETFs out there, too. OK, like if you're a traditional finance person, broker dealer, registered investment advisor, are you buying coins direct? Or are you just going to buy the ETFs? Like. Like, Evan, what do you think? Like, you just buying the ETFs or you're going to try and figure out how to, like, custody, custody these coins, which ones are securities, which ones are not securities? Like, what do you, what do you think about this? It, it really depends on the advisor and the strategy that they're looking for. Um, I would imagine the majority of advisors who want to give their clients a small sliver of exposure to crypto will probably just use the ETFs or even right. the closed-end funds that are offered by Grayscale which give you like a little bit broader exposure with some of the other altcoins. Um, right, right. Versus, versus trying, I mean, there isn't even a, from my understanding, there is no SEC publicly approved crypto custodian that is a qualified custodian that an RIA can officially use. There are some ones that have said that they are qualified custodians and there hasn't been clarity from the regulators and they're just doing, right. they're just going that way anyways. Um, but I would imagine that with the ETFs, the majority of advisors are going that route. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean it's all advisors. And I don't necessarily mean that. I think that's the best option. Yeah, personally. I got you. Nick, what do you, what do you think? You think, you think folks just buy the ETFs or they, they start going direct, some of these more traditional people? Yeah, just, just objectively, if I'm looking at something like a Grayscale, the, the fees on it are pretty hefty. I mean, they are. You know, yeah, so they are high. In that case, um, and also go, going back to Evan's point on the, the custody, I mean, Coinbase has a brilliant custody business. They're ahead of the game. They have great lawyers. They understand how, how everything's meant to function. So, yeah, I would actually feel more confident just hope opening up a, a Coinbase wallet and investing directly in, in Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever it might be. So I would go that versus way, the ETF versus the ETF. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I mean, but I, I just, if, 
if I'm getting effectively the same thing and I'm not going to get mm-hmm. hosed on, on the, on the actual on the trade fee. itself, then why would I pay right. whether it's 35, 50 or a percent, you know, basis points, Fair 1% point. more. But it's the risk, right? Because Coinbase does have a custody, an institutional custody business called Coinbase Prime. Gemini has one as well. They're operating under the state trust depository rule to become a qualified mm-hmm. custodian. And the SEC has explicitly said that it does not believe that those are qualified custodians by the rules. So if you are an RIA and you are taking client dollars and you're putting them into Coinbase Prime and you're holding those assets, you are taking some marginal risk. Now, Coinbase is going to say, right. you're, you're basically taking the risk that if the SEC comes after you and says that, hey, you're holding assets for your client in a non-qualified custodial way, you're betting that Coinbase is going to foot the bill on the legal side to fight for you. And I think that's a pretty good bet for what it's worth. Coinbase has basically come out and said that they will continue to fight the good fight for anyone who wants crypto and regulatory clarity in the United States for institutional crypto. But it is not yeah. without risk. And you as an advisor still hold that risk individually. And there's just like, you you know, advisors take that stuff seriously. And you have to wonder, remember, if you're, if you're an RIA, especially if you're a traditional RIA and you're managing someone's portfolio of mostly stocks and bonds and ETFs, and like, this is like, what, less than 1% of someone's portfolio, how much risk do you want to take on your entire career in business for or someone, to, for someone's s- tiny little pain? Thing? Versus so, 20 basis points at the Bitcoin ETF. So are we not still removed from that because of the ETF? I mean, is going to hold these assets and, and that has to be custodied somewhere else as well. So now you're just trusting that whichever well, yes. custodian the ETF well, uses, right? And then you're still paying. Well, to be clear, you're not wrong. the, the, the you're SEC wrong. has said that Bitcoin and Ethereum are not securities. Right. They have given that guidance. And therefore, those assets do not need to be held in qualified custody effectively. Now, within an ETF, they do need to be, and therefore Coinbase custody and Gemini have had that. And so that's sort of like my understanding of like the gray area that the regulator- regulators have gotten comfortable with, which is why those ETFs have somewhat been approved for futures and now for spots. That does not necessarily apply to all the other crypto assets, which Coinbase does custody and Gemini do custody as their qualified custodian. They do follow the exact same rules that a trust company is required to, holding those deposits one-to-one, not lending against them, holding them with security. I mean, in my opinion, my personal opinion, taking off my like, you know, regulatory hat, I think that they should be considered qualified custodians. And Anchorage has an OCC license. They should also be considered mm-hmm. a qualified custodian. And there's someone trying to get a bank charter in Wyoming. They should have been approved for a bank charter. But the regulators have continued to stop them every step of the way and continue to deny whether or not they consider them a legal custodian in the eyes of the qualified custody. So, and so, so bring, it is yeah. still a gray area. Right. So bringing it back to eToro, but, but also like maintaining on this on this area so let's say just to make it easy you pay um a one percent management fee just to make the the math nice i mean it's in my mind less than one percent you might have any sort of event like etoro says hey you got 180 days to to move you know if you're in the u.s you have anything but ether or bitcoin or or uh, bitcoin cash you, you gotta shove off Okay, so then I it dips down and you buy in somewhere else, you buy another exchange. But if I'm every year paying my 1% and I could circumvent that and just buy the hard asset, I yeah. think I'm, I'm still leaning on the asset side. And maybe not as an yeah, RIA, you, you bring up some really good points, right? Yeah. Also, the, the, I, the qualified custodians do charge you a custody fee. It's not free. Like you do have to pay them 20 to 50 but, basis points. But that's well, yeah, well less. Yeah, well less than... What it, what it would be investing in an ETF I, though, right? Listen, Maybe I would all list. I think all this crypto stuff is super expensive because even when because I have a Coinbase account, right, Nick? Yeah. So, and I, not because right, I chose. Well, no, no, we were, like, we were you know, all like, in, you a couple years ago. We we're, were all I, really interested, and I have to understand it. So you open well, up an account, you fund it, and yeah, you well, see no, that's works. what sure. I did. I was I rem- listen. I remember I was at a bar with this financial advisor, and he was telling me about his like cousin or something that went down to some South American country and like everybody was put, putting their money into Bitcoin. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like countries, whole countries are using this. Like I'm in, like I'm going to buy some. So the only place at that time to get it was to open up like a Coinbase account. Right. So that's, that's what I did. Cause that seemed like to Evan's point, that seemed like the safest place to go. If you were going to do it, that was like the safest place to do it at. Right. Um, so that's what I did. But I, I would say this to me, this looks and smells, 
having been a product guy at Morgan Stanley and TD Ameritrade, like literally would have been in the room deciding what if we were going to do this or not, right? I would say we would not do it, right? And, and I would say this looks like gold. To me, this looks like gold. So there's IU and, and uh, oh my gosh, I can't remember the tickers for gold ETFs. I use iShares and then there's GLD. AUU or something like that. I think it's, is, is the spider one, but the, the, so the, so there's two gold ETFs. So like, you know, if you want to buy gold, you buy the ETF. You don't even think about like, I'm going to buy gold bars and like hold them in custody at some vault somewhere for my client. You know what I mean? Like there's so much administrative pain. And that's the key thing with, at least with what I see in traditional finance, like broker dealers and, 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 and investment advisors. Like if there's too much administrative pain, it's like, ooh, that's like way too, it's too hard. You know, and I think to Evan's point, if you're, if you're only going to have a very small allocation in the portfolio, then why am I doing that? Like I can just go and buy that thing and maybe, maybe even to your point, Nick, even if it is more expensive, even if it's twice as expensive, it's so much less administrative pain. You know what I mean? And all I have to do is just type a ticker into order entry and I'm done. And if I want to sell it, I can sell it intraday. Like, there's like liquidity. It's easy. It's simple. My compliance department won't give me fits about it. Like simple, 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 right? Yeah. Versus the opposite, which is like super complex. I think it's worth it. You know what I mean? Um, so unless that fee, the incremental fee, which I will say this, because the other thing, Nick, is I looked at the spreads that the broke, like Coinbase charges, they rip your face oh, off really? on the trade. Yeah, that's the other oh, thing. Yeah. It's, like, it's like almost 1%. Like you can get like, I, it, I've seen it even higher than that. Evan. Yeah. Like I've seen it like multiple percent, depending on what's going on. Right. And, you know and what I'm saying? And they're not a broker dealer. So therefore they don't have a best execution or a fiduciary responsibility. So like you might get your, like I, I like the math actually, when you think about the ETFs and I've spent some time thinking about this because I think that the best place to hold crypto is in your retirement account because it's especially a Roth account because it obviously has like all the upside and none of the tax opportunity but yeah. at the same well, no, time it's taxed it's taxed like income too not like a commodity. Well, yeah, future in a roth yeah. game and a roth yeah. Yeah, yeah but the thing is right, right, like, right the roth right. you really have to buy it either in a, like a self-directed account or you could buy it in, as the etf and you're like well i could pay one percent fee to buy bitcoin in my self-directed ira today or i could buy the etf today and pay 20 basis points a year but if you're going to retire in 20 years 20 basis points over 20 years is pretty expensive versus like a one yeah. percent buy today so like it really Fair does your you're, you're, how long you're planning to hold the asset for also really does play into your your strategy there because if you're an ria and you're like i'm gonna hold it for three years four years of my time on like it doesn't really make sense to buy it directly because you're okay. gonna pay almost the same to transact it so here's my, here's my crystal ball on this. Okay. I think being an old ETF guy, right? Like I think ETF companies will just keep bringing out different coins. Okay. So they'll bring out, I don't know, whatever's next Solana. They'll just keep bringing them, you know, and the SEC will like approve them. And as long as nothing blows up, they'll just keep approving these new coins. And then it will all be like super institutional and super controlled because it will be all the normal suspects, usual suspects. So the SEC will be comfortable with that and feel like they have their arms around it. Right. And uh, and then they'll start doing fund to funds where you can get multiple coins in one basket and all that stuff. Right. So I, I, that's how I see this going. And I see crypto getting really big. And I'm not talking about like tech, technology applications. I'm just talking about pure investment opportunities, right? I see like a lot of ca capital going into the space for the sole purpose of it will be administratively simple now to get exposure to it for huge piles of ca assets, yeah. right? For that are asset at, allocation and then also the transfer yeah. of wealth between the baby boomers and everyone else below. Yeah. I mean, there's like what, I don't know how much total I should know this, but like, you know, in the wealth management space, there's like 40, $50 trillion in the United States alone. Right. So like now all of a sudden you've opened that up. Solana can now access $50 trillion, like in a order entry ticket, it's simple. Right. So like, I just think you'll start to see that's my crystal ball. And my experience, I don't see like Morgan Stanley deciding to start custodying uh, cryptocurrency you know, like directly. And I just, I don't know. Yeah. Unless I, I could see them maybe doing if they're institutional side of their business, like pensions, endowments, foundations, hedge funds, stuff like that, right? Because they could charge margin or whatever, like, and just make a ton of, but I don't think they'll ever do it for like Mr. and Mrs. Smith wealth management client, right? Um, I think they'll stay away from that.
That's my gut, at least my gut kind of take on it. But I don't know, man. We haven't talked about crypto in forever, guys. It's like off the radar. It's not off the radar in my world. Not off the radar in your world? Okay. I'm thinking about it a lot. I think it's I think it's a good opportunity. And I I, I have a totally different view on the future than you do, but it's besides you the point. Do? I think oh well maybe next well, let's talk next time let's talk about time. your view. Because um and then, who cares and then what for I the think. eToro, I mean like like you were saying, Aaron, it's one point five million bucks to settle. Neither ad, ad, admitting or denying guilt. Yeah. Is this a, is this beneficial though? Because you kind of want to see an eToro fight, but if you're only getting fined one point five million, why would you fight? You know, you. Well, I think you, you're getting one point fined one point five million because you didn't fight, Nick. That's what. That's what yeah, I yeah, want. Yeah, but, but it's going to cost experience. them at least one point five million if they were to put up a fight, and then it's not a, for sure not a sure thing. So well. I, but Nick, not to interrupt. If you put up a fight with the SEC on something like this, they charge, they fine you like two hundred and fifty million or something crazy. You know what I mean? But if you come in and they're like, "You shouldn't have done this," and you're like, "I'm sorry, you're right. I shouldn't have done this." You know, like, let me fix it, and they'll be like, "Okay, like they're gonna do the right thing and fix it." Well, One point five million right. fine. They didn't, they didn't and, say, "Okay, we shouldn't have done this." They just backed away, and that's why they have the just those three currencies, right? But um, I just this I'm is hopeful like the, that this doesn't set a bad precedent because for we space. all see a bright future within cryptocurrencies and anything related to digital assets, right? So that that's the hope. You kind of want someone else to come on, come in and fight. Maybe that's going to be uh, Robin Hood or one of the others that is, is, right. is being like dragged through uh, some SEC. But I don't, this is the thing, Nick. I don't know if that like the demands there with like these traditional pools of money. I don't know if the demand, that's what I guess maybe the the, the genesis of my question is like, you know, as the product teams at Fidelity and JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and UBS, are they like pulling their hair out trying to find ways to custody crypto assets? Like, right. I don't, I don't think they are, man. Like now that we got these ETFs, Wait, I think yeah. that's like relieved pressure for, you know, for the market at large, the ETFs are the best option. Right. Yeah, I that's think that's fair. I think that's kind of where I'm at with it. You know, like you're going to have some people who are like super into this and then, you know, but but look, I we'll see what happens with the technology. It's it's interesting. The reason I maybe maybe we talk more about this next time, too, because it's like, where's crypto going? Because I mean, I still believe in the technology, but I haven't seen like a ton. Well, I think I guess I have seen started to see a lot of people implement it. Right. But I haven't seen that being able to like you've been able to monetize that through coins. You know what I mean? Where you could like make investments that would warrant a UBS product team to say, hey, we got to have custody of this stuff because there's all these coins out there now that our clients want to buy. You know, like I'm not seeing that kind of stuff happen. Um, but what do you think? Yeah. Next time? Let's talk about that next time. Just around eToro, I mean, just to close the gap here or cl close the book on it, they're really not a huge US player. Like they're a global exchange. Like I think that for them, yeah, it is real. it's not worth yeah. the fight here. They're offered it one. They, they're in, you know, every other jurisdiction around the world. I think that this is like, they're probably just like, it's not worth the fight. Yeah. They're up a lot. Etoro, I, Nick, I have Etoro up 107% from March of 2023, their last round. Right. So they were going to do a SPAC. Remember that Etoro? They were going to do a SPAC yeah. and then like back away from it. Yeah. But you're not wrong, man. Those guys are out of Israel. Um, I've actually met some of the guys on their executive team. They're like really nice, nice guys, smart, right? And and a uh, big business in Europe, you know. Yeah, but I hope this they is not listen. Tiny for them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I wish that I wish those guys the best. I mean, I don't think to your point. I, mean, I don't think this was like a big part of their total revenue at Etoro. Um. So I don't think it like impacts their business that much. I mean, who maybe their business plans, right? For the U.S. is a little bit different. We'll have to be a little bit different now. But um, yeah, I mean, I wish those guys the best. You know? Yeah. Um, okay, we can close up there. I got more to talk about, but we don't have to talk about it. <laughs> All right, cool. That sounds good. All right, fellows, that three good topics today. Oh yeah. I'm not buying. If we ever buy Nick uh, a plane ticket, I'm not buying it on United. I know go. that now. So <laughs> you're buying it on Starlink <laughs> Airlines. That. Yeah, and if, if they got so far away, that's right. I like that. I like that. I like that. All right, fellas, Good, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for this today. Later. Thanks, man. Bye, guys.